Sola Scriptura. What does that mean? Only the Bible. I want to read to you from Jeremiah 15, 16. If you could find that in your Bible, Jeremiah 15, 16. Most of us know where Daniel is. It's before Daniel, a couple of books. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. Here's what it says. Your words were found, and I did eat them, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing in my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. My words were found. I did eat them. You know, I want, this, I want to experience this Bible truth that Jeremiah experienced, don't you? The Bible being the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I know this is one of my great needs. Often here on Sabbath morning, I'm speaking to you about my own personal needs. Hopefully, others will listen in, but I'm speaking to myself too, okay? We all need this. God made our hearts alike. The Bible says so in Proverbs 27, 19, it says, as water, as in water face answers to face, so the heart of man to man. I look out into your faces, I see the same needs that I have, right? And uh, so uh, we all have the same spiritual needs. So as I preach to my own heart, I will be speaking to other hearts as well this morning. The Christian who is healthy and happy and spiritually alive will feed upon God's words like Jeremiah did. And that spiritual food will grow sweeter as the days go by as we search for them. The text says, thy words were found. To me, that suggests <clears throat> that there was a search. And the Bible is like a mine that's never completely worked out. Veins of ore in different directions of different value. And uh, you know, that's what the Bible is to us. You know, when we eat food, we do more than just shovel it down and uh, swallow it like a puppy dog, right? Have you ever watched a dog eat? <laughs> especially when he's hungry. But whether, rather we chew the food and we masticate it and we taste it and we enjoy it. And I'm interested sometimes in watching other people eat. Have you ever, do, do you ever do that? They have happy faces. It's a pleasant time when they're sitting down to a meal. You know, God could have made food tasteless. It could uh, be very boring to us. He could have just given us a mouth as a funnel to throw the food into and it goes down the stomach. He could have done that, couldn't he? You know what? If he had done that, most of us would starve to death because a lot of the benefit that we get from our food is tasting it and being happy about it. Good tasting food and also food comes in all kinds of different colors, doesn't it? Wonderful colors. We'd never eat as much as we should We'd uh, get weak and feeble. I was going to say feek and weeble. We'd probably do that too. But he made us so that we can enjoy our food. I sat down in the BLC this morning and said, what? the tablecloths all have watermelon on. It made me hungry this morning. And that's why he put so many wonderful different flavors in the food. Just think of a nice ripe mango chill just right. You can't get too many of those, but right now is the mango season. If you're, if you're a mango fan, uh, right now is the time to go and get mangoes. It'll last for another month, and then it'll be a little harder to get good ones. But uh, good mango, a good mango is by far my, my favorite food. We're told that the tree of life will have 12 manner of fruits. What a wonderful thought to think about that. Colorful, delicious fruit. And uh, the more that we think about this, the more we long for heaven. We used to sing a song, Homesick for Heaven. How many of you are homesick for heaven? We read about it and uh, 
you know, heaven will be a wonderful place. So uh, we taste it. We chew it. We suck the juice out of it. Just like uh, the birds sucked the juice out of my tomatoes this week. You know, they get in there from the bottom. And um, I saw a nice tomato, a nice red tomato. I picked a tomato and I, after it came off, it was awfully light. I looked over and the whole inside was uh, like a tennis ball. You know, if you'd cut the end of it off, it's all hollow inside. But we try to fix that. We try to put some netting around and uh, hopefully we got the problem stopped. But the bird just sat there. I saw him one day. He just stands there and looks at me. You know, he's just trying to make a living too. And we chew it, we chew up the harder parts, and we think about it, we think about how good it is. You know, the scripture brings to us the most wonderful flavors, spiritual vitamins, and the rest of it. And when we come to the word of God, spiritual food, thy words were found and I did eat them. And they were unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. You want real joy? In thy presence is the fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. You know, that's what we get when we begin to turn our, our, our minds toward the Bible. Many will tell you that their faith is weak. I've heard people say, well, I just dread the time of trouble. I don't think that I could have the faith to go through the time of trouble. I've heard that. You've all heard that probably. Um, a dread of the time of trouble. But we must encourage people who have this feeling to know that faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. The, God, the Lord is not wasteful. He'll give us the right kind of faith when the right time comes. If, we, if he gave that kind of faith to us now, we'd probably waste it, right? But faith comes by hearing. In the hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. The word of God enters the human spirit, encouraged by the Holy Spirit, and becomes faith and belief and trust in Jesus. That's what we get. If we have a church full of Bible students, each praying for the Holy Spirit, then God has a powerful church. What do you say? Amen. We read the wonderful words and we eat them, and they become to us the joy and rejoicing of our hearts. Jesus himself is the Word. We have our, our Bibles here, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to the words of Jesus. Jesus himself is the living Word. We have the written Word. He's the living Word. And the Bible says that the Word was made flesh and dwell among us. John 1.14 all the light, all the truth that is found within the word was, was and is in Jesus Christ, the incarnate God. That's just how important the book is to us. John 1, 1 says in the beginning was the, what does it say? Word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Okay. So, uh, Revelation 19.13 talks about a white horse. It's a description, one of the very symbolic descriptions of the second coming of Jesus. Jesus riding on a white horse. And it says on his vesture, it says his name is called the Word of God. The Word of God is coming. If we spend a little bit of time now with him now, devouring the Word, eating the Word, we will, we will love his appearing. He's coming again, I think, very, very soon. John 1, 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. These are interesting words. There are four words in the New Testament that uh, are very much synonyms in their context. The words are life, light, love, and righteousness. I want to repeat those again. Life, light, love and righteousness. And if you happen to find those in a text someplace, you can interchange any of these words and you won't change the meaning of the text. Jesus is all of those things to us. And you can take these words and interchange them. Jesus is all of them. 
Now, John 6, verse 35. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to have you look at this with me. John chapter 6, verse 35. Over to the right a few pages. John 6, verse 35. Here's what it says. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. Jesus is not only the good shepherd, but he's also the good pastor. He is also the very food upon which the sheep feed. He is this food of life. John 6, where we're in John 6, let's turn over to verses 57 and 58. 57 and 58. John 6, 57 and 58. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, he that eats this bread shall live forever. He had already told them that those who ate his flesh and drank his blood would never die. Verse 53. This was a hard saying for the Jews. He's uh, putting himself on the elevated with the Torah, which they thought was so precious, and it was. Can you imagine the anger that came to the, to the Jewish leaders when they saw Jesus identifying himself as the, as the Torah, the living word? And uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't take it. They tried to make a literal thing out of it, eating his flesh directly and eating his blood, drinking his blood literally. Even Martin Luther, the great reformer, had a discussion about this with Zwingli, the Swiss reformer, about whether this was literal or symbolic. And uh, Luther held that the communion bread was literal, literally eating the flesh and blood of Jesus. And Zwingli said it was spiritual. Literal versus symbolic. Even today, some theologians try to make this into a crass, uh, materialistic idea. But in John 6:63, he explains the whole thing. Let's look at John 6 now, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. He's talking like Jeremiah did here. The words, thy words were found and I did eat them. And they were unto me the joy and rejoicing in my life. It is the spirit that quickens, gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So as we read and meditate on the Bible truth, we have communion with him every day. We can have a communion service in, the, in your closet, in your little study. Every day you can have a communion service, partaking of his, blood, blood, of his, um, of his life. From Ellen G. White, Review and Herald, November 23, 1997, this is what she said. As the word of God is received into the soul, we are partakers of the flesh and blood of the Son of God. It enlightens the mind. The heart is open still more to receive the engrafted word, that we may grow thereby. As the blood is formed in the body by the food eaten, so Christ formed within by eating the word of God. He who feeds on that word has Christ formed within the hope of glory. You know, a soul without Christ is like a body without blood. It doesn't work. It's dead. Paul talks about people without Christian hope as being dead in trespasses and sins. Now another spirit of prophecy quotation. Same uh, passage. It may have the appearance of spiritual life. 
It may perform certain ceremonies and religious matters like a machine, but it has no spiritual life. When a soul receives Christ, he receives his righteousness. He lives the life of Christ. What a provision. Then it can be said, as in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet what? Christ liveth within me. This is the privilege of all the sheep of God's pasture. Spiritual food is provided to us. And the gracious invitation is given, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34, 8. This is our banquet. And our daily prayer should be, give us this day our daily bread. And uh, you know, he does that. We all have enough food on our tables, but he gives us the spiritual bread. In God's living room, in the first apartment of the sanctuary, he left the lights on for us. The lights are there, right? Representing the Holy Spirit. The bread is there, representing his word. And we have the opportunity of communing with him through the prayer life, the altar of incense there in God's living room. Paul, in training his young evangelist friend, Timothy, had these words for him, words of our scripture reading. Let's turn to 2 Timothy. I'd like to have you look at him. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And woe is me if I don't follow this counsel. So, 2 Timothy 4, 1. It says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. What does that mean? Sometimes somebody asks you a question, right? Ready. Be ready. Be ready. How can we be ready unless we spend some time in God's word every day? Be in, he's, Paul is talking to a, a man, a young friend of his, who he's wanting to be a, an evangelist, right? To help people find Jesus. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, rebuke exhort with all long suffering and, do and doctrine. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. But watch you in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. In, John, in uh, Acts chapter 17, Paul is talking to some, some philosophers. And they heard Paul preach. Pretty soon they put their fingers in their ears and they say, we don't want to hear any more from you. And, uh, and they didn't. That was final. I don't think, you know, Paul was trying, to, was trying his best to encourage them in a spiritual life. Later on, he said, you know, I've determined I'm not going to talk about anybody about Jesus, but anything except Jesus from here on. What do you think about that, Jim? Pretty good advice, right? So, uh, why, why preach the word? There should be inspiration to go home and like the Bereans, see if what we're saying here this morning is true. If we'll search the scriptures that way, we'll be prepared. We'll be in season and we'll be out of season. And so doing, We'll grow strong in doing God's will. Take focus on the word and the Holy Spirit will cause you to have faith in a knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Also, the message from God must be appropriate for the time in which it's given. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. What do you think he talked about? <laughs> Boy, that's a big subject, isn't it? Preacher of righteousness, it was, to get, it was to get your house in order, a flood of water is coming. But he preached about righteousness. Whose righteousness do you think he talked about? He knew about the righteousness of God. And uh, in the days of John the Baptist, he would repent and receive the Messiah. And you know, the Bible says that he came to his own and his own received him not. He didn't take, they didn't take his advice. What should we be talking about today? 
I want to express my belief that the whole Bible, the stories in the Bible, the instructions given, the examples and the types, the whole book all focuses on the final generation. You know we have the wisdom of the ages in this book. We have far more information in this book than the apostles even had. A lot has happened since then, right? And we have the book of Revelation. And uh, so in some ways we are better able to preach the gospel and proclaim the gospel than even the disciples were with all the information they had. I mean, they were right with Jesus for three and a half years, weren't they? But we have a record of all of this. All of it focuses on the final generation and they focus on Jesus Christ. Our message is the whole book. You know, the Bible only belongs to those who believe all of it. All others are destined to theological weirdness and heresy, literally. I'll tell you what, every doctrine is blowing out there today, every wind of doctrine. You can hear all kinds of different ideas. But those who read the whole book and compare scripture with scripture are the ones who will come to the truth of what the Bible message is. Just like the devil is preparing for a final battle on earth, he unite, unites his expertise of at least 6,000 years into one final onslaught. He's had a lot of experience, 6,000 years. He, and in Revelation chapter 13, he rolls it all into, up into one thing. A lion, a bear, a leopard, a dragon beast with ten horns. What's that all about? Revelation 13 describes a beast that has all these characteristics. He takes the wickedness of Babylon and the, and the cruelty of Medo-Persia and the prowess and the philosophy of Greece and the blasphemy of Rome and rolls it all up into one ball. What a formidable thing this is, and focuses it on the final generation. Who do you think that might be? Let's read it. Revelation 13, 1 and 2. Revelation 13, 1 and 2. Notice what this beast looks like. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast that I saw was like a, to a leopard, and his feet as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. All of it in one, in one beast. One huge force against the gospel. <clears throat> These are the beasts of Daniel 7. I'd encourage you to go back to Daniel 7, maybe a good Sabbath afternoon read and study those, what came up out of the, out of the sea in Daniel's day. These are the ravenous, carnivorous, ferocious beasts, and they represent Satan's character and personality, and he plunges the whole world into a final conflict of deception and despair. Just so God meets all of this with the power of his word, the whole Bible, the Old and New Testament, focuses on the end of the world, and he summarizes it in the message of three angels. Last quarter, we had the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with the three angel messages in our Sabbath school lessons, in the, in the Bible. Just like with the beast that the devil is using, in the Bible, we have all the cumulative truth from the very beginning, right down through the Christian era, right up to the time of the Christian era in the book of Revelation. All of it's rolled up into one thing. And uh, it gets a formidable thing for the devil, I'm sure. We draw our strength from all of this as we feed upon it every day. In the sanctuary first department, the bread was there, the lights were there, and it was called the daily. Wow, what an idea that is. Every day it happened. How often do you think we should pick up the word? and begin to draw inspiration from it. Daily, it's the daily. And develop a prayer life with God 
and you'll be strong. And when the end time comes, your faith will be such that you'll say, just like somebody said politically here a while back, bring it on. Yes, that's how we will feel about it. And there'll be no fear. We don't want to be fear, fearful of these, of these wonderful things. In the Bible, we have all the accumulated, all accumulations of truth from the last, for the last 6,000 years. The two witnesses of Revelation 11, this frequently comes up in a Bible study, are those, the two witnesses, and I want to say this right, so you get it right. The two witnesses of Revelation are those who proclaim the Bible, Old and New Testaments. Do you know what? As we go out and witness, we're but an extension of the Bible. Is that right? We've often used to say, well, the two witnesses, they are the Old and New Testaments. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. But I'm extending it a little bit further this morning. It is extended to all those who proclaim the Bible truths to their neighbors and friends. We who live in the hour of God's judgment have a last day message to bear. We must understand the Old Testament sanctuary so we can understand the work of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary, right? The Old Testament is a lesson book. We have, we don't slay lambs anymore, right? But as we meditate upon it, what's in the Old Testament, the ceremonial laws, as we meditate upon that, it helps us understand what Jesus is doing for us right now. I would like to have us look at a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. I don't know why they put that clock up there in front of me. Why do you suppose they did that? 1 Corinthians 5, verse 27. I think we're going to be pretty close on time. It's, uh, I said 27, it's 7. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Somebody was groaning because there's, no, there's not that many verses, right? <laughs> Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for Christ, even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. That's an Old Testament idea, right? Passover. It was, it's about the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. So we must understand the sanctuary so that we can, and the book, I tell you, this book is a book about the sanctuary. It is a sanctuary book. All through, Old and New Testaments. Uh, we must understand the creation and the flood so that we can proclaim the Sabbath. We must understand the flood in Sodom and Gomorrah so that we can proclaim God's hatred for sin. All of it's important. We must hear of David and Goliath so that we can withstand the beast and the dragon and emerge victorious. That's what happened when David met Goliath, right? We must understand Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego so we can understand how to live in the time of trouble with confidence and, not, and without fear. All of that's important to us. We must understand his first coming so, we, so that we can be prepared, for, be prepared for his second coming. What I'm saying here is that we need to begin being real serious students of God's word. I'd like to have you turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, 35 to 40. Luke 12, 35 to 40. Do you have it? I want you to all see this one. This is wonderful. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And you yourselves like to men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. What should we be do, what, doing right now? Watching, right, watching. Verily I say to you that 
he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he come, and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have permitted his house to be broken through. Be you therefore ready also, for the Son of Man comes in an hour when you think not, watching and waiting. Could uh, we have our shoes on our feet and our staff in our hand? That's what Moses told the people just before they left, for, for, left Egypt. Tomorrow we leave. Have your staff in your hand and your shoes on your feet. Be ready when that time comes. It's not get ready. Be ready. And have the faith to open the door immediately when he comes from the wedding. The key word is immediately. Probation closes first on those who knew. And it extends to those who have not heard. So our names in the judgment of the living could come any time. But there must be oil in the lamps of the virgins. Thy word is a light, a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. But it won't burn without the oil. I have to tell you, in our prayer life, we need to pray for the Holy Spirit every day. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Pray for a desire. If I'm not willing, pray for a, a willing, willingness to be willing. Uh, the time is short. What will you do about this today and in the new week to come? We are to be on the watch before, because, the, because the Lord comes to our name in the judgment, perhaps at the least expected time. Judgment of the living. Talks about that in the spirit of prophecy. Notice the words to Sardis. Revelation chapter 2. These are the last of the seven churches. And as things begin to wind down, notice how the message gets very urgent here. Luke, uh, Revelation chapter 2, 1, and one, to th one, 1 to 3. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Here it is. I know your works. Wait a minute here. I should be in chapter 3. Church of Sardis. To the angel of the church of Sardis. This is chapter 1. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. These things says he that has seven spirits of God and seven stars. I know your works. That you have a name that you live and are dead. The Sardis church was dead. And he's giving him a warning here. Be watchful. Be what? Watchful and strengthen the things that remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If, therefore, you shall not watch, I will come to you as a thief, and you shall not know what hour I shall come upon you. And then Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8 and 10 and 11. Notice what the message is here. Verse 8. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you a what? When you have seen an open door, what, what are you inclined to do? Somebody opens the door for you. What do you do? You stand there with your hands in your pockets? No, he opens the door for you and he says, come in. And no man can shut it. For I have a little strength and have kept the word, for, I, for you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. And then verses 10 and 11. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the, all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And then verse 11. Behold, what? What does it say next? I come quickly. And hold fast what you have, that no man take your crown. Serious ideas, I think. 
And when the world falls to pieces overnight and we're plunged into the little time of trouble, as the latter rain is falling and we have a message to carry to the world still, we need to be ready in season and out of season. We must be awake and be ready. Do you know that over half the parables of Jesus deal with the judgment hour in which we're living? Over half of them. The judgment going on in heaven. The judgment is the wedding. And when Jesus comes, he will be returning from the wedding and take us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What a thing. Revelation says the new Jerusalem, the Lamb's wife, is representative of the New Jerusalem. It represents God's bride. What does the New Jerusalem look like? When he sees the New Jerusalem, he's reminded of us. It has streets of gold. It has gates of pearls. It has all these precious stones. You read about them in Revelation chapter 21. It represents his bride. He's not interested in the gold. He can speak that into existence, right? He's interested in us, the bride of Christ. The wedding is in heaven. We are on earth. You can read about this in Great Controversy, by the way. But we're represented by that beautiful city with foundation stones and gates, and they all have names on them. I tell you what, we need to make sure our name is written there, right? When is your name enrolled in the book of life? When you give your heart to Jesus. Let us be careful that we have our name written there. You know, we can't do good missionary work unless our eyes are open and we're alert to the goings on around us. I've heard somebody say one day, I don't watch the news. It makes it too scary. What do you think about that? I don't think we ought to be addicted to news, but we should know what's going on around us and what's going on in heaven. You know, the, the spirit of prophecy says all heaven is astir. Can you imagine angels coming back and forth to heaven, ministering to us? They're ministering spirits, right? Ministering to us who are heirs of salvation. All heaven is astir. And the earth is in great agitation. Heaven and earth. Earth in great agitation. Could it possibly be that the church might be asleep? What an terrible idea with all this going on around us in the world and in heaven. It must not be. My final appeal to do today is found in three passages. And I'll be done by a quarter after. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 and 23. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit to unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart. Then what does the next word say? Fervently, fervently. And verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Born again to follow the gospel. Let's look at the second one, 1 Peter 2 this time. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And then verses 9 to 12. But you are a, what does it say next? Chosen generation. No matter what generation on earth that we are living in, we are a chosen generation. But especially the last generation, the final generation, is particularly a chosen generation. One of these days, the devil is going to ask God, where are the people that really serve you? And God will look down and he will say, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. And that people will vindicate God's character. And God has been waiting for that for a long, long time. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. 
which in time past you were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And verses 9 to 12, okay. The last one is Titus. <clears throat> Titus is that little book. <clears throat> right before Hebrews. There's three T's come together, right? What are they? First and second Thessalonians. First and second Timothy. And then Titus. Titus is just kind of a wonderful book, you know. Titus chapter 2, 11 to 15. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. What is the grace of God that brings salvation? The gospel, isn't it? The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. One day soon, there will be padlocks on this church door. I'll guarantee you that. Nobody will be able to come here anymore. Now is the day of preparation. This morning, I want to make an appeal. This is a general appeal as well as a specific appeal. Some of us have been in this way for many, many years. Some of us are just new in hearing this message that we have proclaimed to the world. And for the sake of Jesus, would you like to be one of those that's watchful? No matter how long you've been in the church or how long you have, or whether you're just new, do you want to be watchful? How many of you would like to be watchful? <laughs> Indeed. Would you like to say, yes, I want to be watchful, ready for the new and uncertain week that's ahead of us? We don't know what's coming this week, do we? I'm going to give my heart to Jesus this morning again and reconsecrate my life to him and all that I have to him. Lord, I want to pray for a thirst for God's word. Is that your idea? I want to pray for a thirst for God's word, that I have a great desire to study God's word. If you would express your desire, that's your desire this morning. We'll sing our, our closing song, Standing on the Promises. I think it'll be on the screen. If not, it's uh, page 518, Standing on the Promises. Uh, if this is your desire, I would like to invite you to stand and sing these words with me. These are wonderful words of life. What promises, the promises of God's holy word. Pray that our hearts will be full of faith and love for God and for each other. Let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, that's where we, where we want to stand this morning. I pray, Lord, that you put deep desires in our hearts to want to be watchful, to want to open your word and study it and digest it. I pray that you'll be with each one here according to our several needs. Lord, you look upon us. We are a very diverse church, but each of us has have needs, and I pray that you will fill those needs as we go to our, our homes today, I pray we'll be with a deep desire to want to serve you more, that our horizons might be lifted, and that we might look one day soon and see that small cloud and coming closer and closer and look up into the sky and say, Lo, this is our God. We've waited for him. May that be our prayer this morning, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.